welcome to it. It's the Vaughn Cast. I was driving over here this morning, uh, contemplating talking to Mad Joe Martin, and I thought, man, it's a it's the end of June. It's going to be a hot day. Reminds me of listening to KTRN over at Fane Pool all summer long, hearing all those songs. The night Chicago died. Remember that, Joe? <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying not to. <laughs> trying not to. But, uh, yeah, I was thinking Joe Martin, uh, such a big part of many people's summers back in the 70s. So let's do it. Let's uh, welcome Mad Joe Martin uh, to the podcast. Joe, how you doing, man? Doing great, Keith. Thank you so much. It uh, is an honor, an honor to be up here with you doing this this morning. Well, I, you know, we wanted to get into doing podcasts. People mentioned it to me and they said, you, you got uh, so many contacts and you know so many people and your name jumped right out in my head. And I thought, <laughs> we, we got a history, we got a mutual business, we've been in, 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 in the same market for years and I know you got stories. So, and, and you also have a senior citizen that is now on Social Security. <laughs> well, it's good you made it that far. I Joe. did. I love that. I paid, <laughs> I paid into that system. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it, you know, I don't want to say at the twilight of your career, but you've come to a point where we need to kind of get this down on, <laughs> oh, pa- on paper. I believe, on me, believe me, I know that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think that's uh, kind of what we're doing here. We want to set the record straight on a lot of things. <laughs> for, for, first up, Joe, you, you're a Texan to begin with. You've you've done radio in Texas. You're from Texas. Uh, kind of give us a bit of background on on Joe Martin, where you're from, uh, what it was like being an eight year old kid in the world of Joe Martin. Well, absolutely, and thank you for asking. Uh, let's go back to Denton, Texas. Born there in 1950. We're talking 110 miles down the road. Now a big town, but a sleepy little community back in the 50s. I'll never forget the Saturday morning. My dad and I went down to Sears. They're right off the square in uh, in Denton, and right across the street was KDNT 1440 Radio. And we stood downstairs looking up and seeing the disc jockey up inside of the uh, control room as it faced the street, and he motioned for us to come up. And we went upstairs, climbed up those stairs, and walked into this big area that actually had been where the musicians sat up and played live music back in the 30s and 40s, and possibly there into the early 50s. But the, the disc jockey motioned for us to come into the room and I got to tell you, Keith, as an eight-year-old, looking there at all those knobs and those buttons and seeing that guy as he was so happy when he opened the microphone, smile on his face, KDNT 1440, Denton, Texas. He played Buddy Holly, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I knew that day in the mid-50s I wanted to be a disc jockey. Yeah, see, that's... That, that that was my next question. Where was the genesis? Where was the, the what was the moment where you first kind of experienced the you know, they call it the magic of radio, the the drama of radio. I guess that's the moment. Well it was. Yeah. And all through the sixties when I listened to the mighty eleven ninety KLIF Gordon McClendon station oh, yeah. down in Dallas. It one of if you talk to people in radio, I don't care if they grew up on the East Coast, the West Coast, or up in Chicago. They had heard about KLIF and Gordon McClendon, all the stations that he owned, major market stations. But KLIF and Gordon uh, basically was one of the fathers, one of two, uh, that actually started rock and roll and radio. Things had really been laid back up until the mid to late 50s, and then the rock and roll format came in. But to make a long story short, uh, I had uh, gotten into the 60s and started listening to KLIF and those guys, Jimmy Rabbit, uh, yeah. Dave Ambrose, uh, Ken and Cranny in the morning, on and on, Mike Seldon in the afternoon. Yeah. These were the guys, and KFJZ as well, uh, Marky Baby at 1270 uh, KFJZ inspired me to get into radio. Now, I've got to tell you a story as we fast forward a little later in life. Mm -hmm. I never felt good enough. I felt beneath walking into KLIF because I felt like that was the pinnacle. 
that was the mountain, and I wasn't good enough to climb that mountain. Man. I would walk into KFJZ, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned Mike Seldon, and I just stumbled across a video air check of him. I probably uh, on the yeah. air at, at KLIF. KLIF. I think I believe it's KLIF. Yeah, it was shot by KERA TV. Yes, yeah. yes, great video, yeah. and it is on YouTube. Yeah, he looks like a radio DJ from the seventies. He did, I believe, yeah. he, in that video. I think he even had a, a cigarette fire. He up, did, and he may have even yeah. uh, taken a drag off of it during his open mic moment. I uh, I, <laughs> I, I noted the hair was the hair of the seventies. Had yeah. the aviator shades on, the Fu Manchu mustache. Well, yeah. uh, uh, side note, I'm really getting off on a tangent now, and <laughs> Lord right. knows what we're going to get into yeah. today. But if you look at Selden closely, yeah. James Bond locally, they kind of resembled each other to a degree. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And of course, yeah. James Bond goes back to those days and had worked for a station down in, uh, a lot of people probably don't even know who I'm talking about now, and we'll get into <laughs> it. But he had worked at, I believe, a former Gordon McClendon station down yeah. in Shreveport, Keel, K E E L. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he did. You're right. Oh, well, we got off on a tangent there. Oh, well, let me go back further back into the life of Joe. Back, uh, You mentioned uh, listening to the radio as, as a kid. What else were you into as a kid when you got, like, you know, into your adolescence what were, besides girls oh, oh, and rock and roll? No, no, no. No girls. Oh. No girls at that time. Yeah. Cars and music. There you Had go. Typical. Yeah. You know, I am the typical teenager from the 60s. The guys, they all love the cars. They wanted to see the new cars come out. Yeah. I know you're a Ford guy, but I was pretty heavy into Chevys. Well, you know, I think years ago we had a discussion about hot rods, and you, you, you didn't you say you worked for a Chrysler I did. dealership? The yeah. Chrysler Plymouth dealership there in Denton on yeah. South Locust. Uh, it, it was a real treat. I had graduated high school, and this was when I was going to North Texas. And I got to drive the cars from the transport that would come off and take them to the wash oh, bay. And we're talking man. the 440s, the 346-packs. Uh, didn't think a thing about it. Brand, and brand new cars. Brand new cars. Wow. Brand new Roadrunner, four-speed, 383, positive track rear end, tachometer, $2,750. Oh, my gosh. And you were there. See? I, I was there, and I lived it. Man. See, that that's... I, I always tell people that I think the baby boom generation is not only lucky for being post-war, but also just the place and culture we were. The music, the cars, the technology, it was all at a very good, kind of a good place at that time. I, I agree, yeah. and I, I think I grew up at the right time. Uh, I, I hear others younger than me saying they kind of wish they had seen what went on in the 60s. Yeah, it's, it, it was uh, light years from where it is today, and mm -hmm. uh, for a guy my age and probably you, yeah. we see a lot of things today that uh, it, it's hard to swallow compared to what we right. grew up to. And I know you, yeah. you grew up back there in the 70s, mm -hmm. and uh, – the 60s for me, uh, 80s, the 80s for you is yeah. what the 60s were for me. Yeah. Oh, I can see that. Well, growing up in, in Denton and it being a, let's let's be honest, it's good old Texas town. And then oh, you, yeah. you got the influx of the 60s and the counterculture and the social changes. Was, was Denton a place that was easy for that to you know coexist or was it or were, were there tough times well uh, back in the late 60s and of course i uh, started north texas uh, in the fall of 69 and mm -hmm. i do recall in the spring of 70 the very first earth day uh wow, i man. went and sat in the park listened to the speakers <laughs> listened to the bands i was a uh, typical freshman in college trying yeah. to open up my mind and yeah. my ears and I've got to be honest with you, Keith. I, I don't think at North Texas in Denton, I don't think there really was much counterculture at that mm -hmm. time. The summer of 1969, Louisville, Texas, International Pop Festival occurred, uh, what, two weeks after Woodstock up in Bethel, New York. Mm hmm only about 500,000, no, no, <laughs> 500,000 at Woodstock. I believe it was reported maybe 50,000 at uh, Texas yeah. International Pop. And that was held down at Louisville. And I was so cheap in those days that uh, I, I tell people I did attend 
that festival for three days, but I sat outside the gate because I didn't want to pay the money to get in, but I still <laughs> got to hear the music. Grand Funk Railroad played three days. Wow. They were not paid. Man. They were done. Uh, they did that on strictly a promotion to get their name out. And, of course, after that, uh, that pretty much set the stage for GFR. Wow. I did not know that part. That's amazing. <laughs> a lot of people forget about that festival. They uh, Or many don't even know about oh, yeah. it. But, right, yeah. Right. And actually, yeah. what uh, was the 50-year tribute, I believe, uh, would have been five years ago, down in Louisville, they did have a 50-year anniversary tribute festival again in honor of the Texas International Pop Festival. Wow. And uh, I didn't go, but uh, it, it did happen. Yeah. When you were growing up, Joe, did uh, did people comment on your on your dialect, on your your speech pattern on your voice did they were the teachers the ones who would always say let's turn it to page 52 and joe would you start reading for us you know well i i would say that uh certainly my choir teacher said uh joe we're putting you at baritone <laughs> <laughs> daddy sang bass <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, and, I, and I also wanted to uh, go to work with the Oak Ridge Boys, uh, had their oh, bass yeah. singer ever, ever <laughs> left. But, but uh, back <laughs> to what you ask. Uh, yeah. No, uh, I think over the years the voice kind of changed, and I, I learned how to use it a little better. Mm -hmm. uh, when I have a microphone in front of me, of course, if you're from New York City or you're from the Boston area, I'm sure you can hear the Texas and Joe Martin's sure. voice. Yeah. But if you're a local Texan, you're saying, no. I don't hear it as much as I do other people in Texas, right. but yeah. uh, it's very ironic. The first radio job that I attempted to get in Denton at KDNT 1440, mm -hmm. I'll never forget, I went in to see Harwell Shepard. He was the station owner, and I carried in my air check, and uh, I had uh, majored in uh, radio TV at North Texas. Carried in my air check. He listened to it for three minutes, and he said, son... Let me give you some advice. You need to change your plans. You do not have the voice for radio. It's time for you to make a career change that oh, never even man. started. Now, I had gone to Elkins Institute that summer, summer of 71, and obtained my first class telephone operator's license, which was quite an accomplishment back oh, yeah. in those days. Uh, for people in radio, that was almost a PhD. Yeah, absolutely. And I had that first yeah. class, but Harwell looked at me and he said, you know, you don't have that voice, but let me hire you to set you in the doghouse to read my meters every three minutes off the antennas. <sighs> he said, I'll pay you $1.25 an hour to do that. And I said, I think I'm heading to Kansas. I'm going to try to get me a job up there. <laughs> and that, that brings us actually up to uh, the 1972 when uh, I kind of headed down 287 and ended Man. up in a little place called Wichita Falls. Well, when you did go to Kansas, what, uh, what was the station? KSCB, the Big 1270. And how long were you in Kansas? At that point, yeah. I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. I turned 21 up there in November of 71. I've got to tell you, Keith, <laughs> this radio station, I mean, th th this this was very, very outdated, yeah. as many were back in those days. The stations of the 70s, if they had not been updated, were using equipment from the 40s a lot of times, yeah. 50s. Oh, yeah. And this station was located about, oh, a quarter of a mile south of the big packing plant up in Kansas, Ooh. Liberal. Yeah. We were south of the packing plant, and I went up there in the summer. Oh, no. And when the oh, wind, no. would, <laughs> wind would blow, it was rough, bro. Oh, it Lord. was rough, the stench coming out of there. And uh, mm. I uh, also experienced the coldest winter I had ever seen in my life. I, wow. Of course, being in Denton, had never seen snow in October wow. and saw snow, lots of snow oh, up man. in liberal Kansas. And the only thing stopping that 50-mile-an-hour wind was a barbed wire fence. Man, liberal Kansas. Yeah. I got out of there fast. My, my dad used to tell stories about being stationed uh, there in the Army Air Corps back, way, way back. And, yeah, he wasn't a, a big fan either. Um, when you were in Kansas, uh, w were you looking to leave that station and go somewhere else? Well, it was kind yeah. of a fluke. Uh, I had been there six months, and by golly, I thought, you know, 
I deserve a pay raise. I've been here six, <laughs> but I've got to tell you, Keith, first yeah. radio gig, and I'm working afternoon drive. You know, wow. rolling home with. Ron Rice on the radio. All right. Oh, wow. We threw out a new name. How about that? <laughs> well, I, I guess you might have looked through uh, some of the uh, trades looking for places oh, I did. that were. And I'll never forget, yeah. uh, after six months, I had gone in. Uh, Stu Melcher was the uh, part owner and yeah. general manager. And I walked in. I said, Mr. Melcher, been here six months, and I kind of think that maybe I deserve a raise. I was pulling down a hundred a week at that time. And I mm. said, uh, maybe if I could get 105 a week. And Man. he said, uh, no, no, we can't. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's not in the business plan this week. Man. And so I started pumping out air checks and I'll never forget. Uh, I sent some to Amarillo. Yeah. Uh, of course, up there in liberal, we would listen to kicks K I X Z. Oh yeah. yeah. Which, was the sister station of a Wichita Falls station. We'll talk about it in a minute. Yeah, I listened true. to Caper occasionally if I would go south. Yeah. And I would send out air checks to uh, Amarillo, Lubbock. I remember sending some out to Midland, Odessa. Even sent some to Austin. Mm-hmm. And uh, hard to believe that I thought I could uh, qualify for working Austin radio after six months being in the business. But I sent some anyway. Anyway, down to uh, KNOW, which was the number one top 40 station down there in Austin at the time. Yeah. And then we have to say, I did send an air check to KTRN 1290 in Wichita Falls. Wow. Had you ever heard of KTRN before? Well, that? I actually had because I would pass through Wichita Falls oh. on my way to Liberal. From, yeah. De- from Denton to Liberal, I yeah. would come through Wichita Falls and come close to Amarillo, and that's how I knew about the stations up there. Wow. And I wanted to go to work at a top 40 station. I did yeah. not want to do country. Mm-hmm. Probably could have gotten hired down in East Texas to do some country, but I wanted top 40, and do you know why? Because I cut my teeth listening to KLIF. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, it, the the early early days, like in those days, um, people don't realize it that you just couldn't jump online and upload your demo and uh, communicate back right. and forth. You had to get a tape, record well, and it. It was a real to real tape. Yeah, we yeah. didn't even send cassettes back in those days. Wow. And you would send a res- resume and a cover letter, and yeah. uh, you had to pump those resumes up real good. Yeah. You know, uh, I remember in the early days uh, of sending out the resumes, I was a member in high school, a member of Demo Lay. Yeah, Demo Lay. Yeah. Well, they generally were thought to be pretty nice young men. Yeah. And I always threw that into the resume. <laughs> Demo, I haven't heard that name in, or that organization's name in years. I assume they're still around. I think they are. Wow. Well, in those early days when you were doing Top 40 Radio, who were the uh, your, your, your peers at that time that were in the bigger markets that you were listening to. Oh, my to. word. Yeah. Oh, my word. Truckin' Tom Kent. Yes. Machine Gun Kelly. <laughs> Jack Armstrong, the fastest talking radio D. De- Folks, if you're listening to this and you don't know who I'm talking about, go on YouTube and do searches for Jack Armstrong disc jockey. Yes. Machine Gun Kelly. Truckin' Tom Kent. Oh, my word. Yeah. Oh, my word. Exactly. High energy. High energy. Yeah. Unbelievable. Crazy. (laughs) Uh, We were listening to a KOI affair check the other day, and the amount of reverb Uh that was used. Uh And I guess they must have had a way to crank it up while they were on the air, because this guy was using it to accentuate words. You know, you could hear it just like, for instance, he'd say, we'll be in downtown Dallas, 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 Dallas. You're like. Wow. Yeah, that's that. That sounds like something yeah. that uh, Russ Knight, the Weird Beard. In fact, yeah, that that's yeah. probably who it was. Nineteen sixty-two. I think you're right. KLIF and uh, Russ Knight, the Weird Beard. Man, well, when you when you do get to Wichita Falls, or uh, let, let me go back further. When did you find out, and and how did you find out that uh, you know Wichita Falls was or KTRN was interested? Well, <laughs> I didn't get that raise at KSCB, so yeah. uh, that day I said, uh, well, I'm giving my two-week notice. Ooh. And I was prepared to drive back to Denton. You sound like a very confident young air talent. Well, yeah. uh, maybe overconfident. <laughs> I uh, gave my notice and had no job. It was yeah. time to go back home and live with Mama and Daddy. But the phone rings 
probably one week after I gave the notice, and it was a fellow whose name is well known in this community, probably as much or more so than my name, especially to people our age, and that was James Bond. Yeah. KTRN, the Mighty 1290, called and said, we've got, we've got a position for you, and uh, we'd love to have you come to work with us. And I called my mother. Well, I told my mother, I said, Mom, I think this is probably the most happiest day in my radio life so far. Wow. And so I came to Wichita Falls, and uh, I guess the rest is history over the years. Uh, Fast forward, I pumped out the air checks, had the offers. Here in a little bit, maybe we can talk about some of the stations that gave me offers. I know some Mm -hmm. people listening will probably say, that guy's full of BS. But uh, it actually happened, and I could not pull myself away from this community. And that uh, explains why I have been here 52 years now. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, yeah, they, they, especially those in this business, and Joe, you've, you've, you've experienced it too, they, let's be honest, they look down on little old Wichita Falls in this, in this region uh, in, in a number of ways. Uh, well, you know, I, first up, I, I think about the uh, Texas uh, Radio Hall of Fame, <laughs> which we've been trying to get, you know, a little bit of recognition up here for years, but uh, we, we did. Yeah, yeah, we did. I, yeah, I, I, I like to take credit for Joe Tom White. You should. Uh, yeah, Joe Tom White uh, came in. Uh, Snuff Garrett. I'll definitely take uh, credit yeah. for getting Snuff in. Snuff should have been in years yeah. ago, and we could we could talk uh, a oh, while yeah. on Snuff. But if you don't know who I'm talking about, do a Google search, and yeah. you will see. Uh, Snuff had, had worked in this town, unbelievable, went on to do big stuff for Liberty yeah. Records, mm-hmm. worked with all the stars of the 60s, produced Cher Bono, yeah. uh, on and on. Amazing. It started right here. Yeah, yeah. And don't forget, one of the biggest ever, Bill Mack. Yes. Bill Mack. Yep. When people in the Texas Radio Hall of Fame talk Bill Mack's name, they think of the Midnight Cowboy at WBAP. Yeah. Boys and girls, it started here in Wichita right Falls, here. KWFT 620. Yeah. If you go to Bill Mack's hometown, Shamrock, yeah. uh, they got a, a monument, kind of a marker there, and it's a picture of him and the microphone he's talking into has a KWFT flag on it, which I thought was Perfect. Well, absolutely, yeah. and uh, I mean the rest. He he was here, and the rest is history. Absolutely. Well, when you get to KTRN and you come to Wichita Falls, was I don't want to use the word culture shock, but it's got to be different from being in Denton in, in those days. <laughs> well, it was yeah. Denton uh, at that time. Population probably thirty eight thousand. I was coming to a major market, Keith. Yeah, I forget one hundred thousand people. Yeah, I forget that in those days Denton was a lot smaller. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. big now. Well, and I was yeah. coming to a town, I believe, with six radio stations at the time, yeah. uh, two FMs and three or four AMs. Yeah. And uh, I felt like I'd hit the big time. Now, when you got to the falls, what were the first first couple of uh, days at KTR and what were they like? Your Your interactions, you know, you've got this preconceived notion, then you get there and reality hits. What was it like? Well, I I slowly uh, worked my way in. I mm. was actually doing seven to midnight. I was hired yeah. to be the nighttime guy. And after about a month in this town of seeing everything close at midnight, I went to management and said, let me take the overnight shift as it had just come open. Mm-hmm. That way I knew I could have, being a single guy in 21, I knew I could have a little social life before going to work at midnight instead of leaving the station at midnight when the town had closed up. So it worked out well, and I stayed overnights for about four and a half years, and then things changed up and got crazy after that. <laughs> um, the name mad martin there's been so many stories i've heard and i laugh when i hear some of them i i I laugh when i hear a lot of them i I recently did a class reunion and these people said man we were listening to you in 1967 68 when we graduated high school i said that's amazing 1968 i was a junior at denton high school 
Yeah. Well, I think in their mind they wish they were listening to you in 68. Well, they they were listening yeah. to someone with a similar name. There and you, go. <laughs> there you go. Did we leave it at yeah. that or do we go, go a little farther? Well, I guess, you know, it was a part of the radio culture in those days. Uh, kind of, ex- I guess, explain that. You, you would come on and you would... Uh, take over a persona, I guess, yeah. is the word. Oh, I could I could talk all day about this. There yeah. are so many similarities between mm-hmm. radio and the personalities of radio and professional wrestling. Yeah. In yeah. professional wrestling, there are aliases. There are storylines. Mm-hmm. There are so many made-up things. If I went on the radio back in 1972 and I said my most – Fond days of being a teenager, we're spending three of them in the uh, reformatory. People would take it to heart and believe that Joe yeah. had actually been in reform school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they could not cut off the joke from seriousness, right. and, and maybe we didn't want them to. Yeah. That was part of the magic of radio. Exactly. But to get back to what we were talking about, when I got to town, the ratings were about to start. Radio ratings. Mm-hmm. The fellow that had left, whose I was replacing, his name was Weird Martin. Mm-hmm. Weird John Martin. So when I got to town, I immediately became Mad Joe Martin. Oh, there you go. And after yeah. a number of years, people assumed that they had been listening to me a whole lot longer than they really had been. <laughs> well, what happened to the first mad? He uh, moved on. I had heard, and I even have done Google searches trying to look. Yeah. Have no idea really where he is, if he's even alive now. Mm-hmm. I had been told that he may have gone down and worked at some point around New Orleans. Hmm. But that's about all I know. There was a big difference between John and myself in the fact that he was married and had about six kids. (laughs) And there was a big difference, and I was happy that I was where I was. was No wonder he was called mad. (laughs) He was weird. No, that was weird. 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 (laughs) That's right. Yeah, Yeah, weird, too. That is crazy. Well, who else on the air at that time might have had... You know, the alias, the the persona going. Well, most everyone in radio back then did. Very few were using their real names for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And they they were sensible reasons. If you got in trouble with the law and your name appeared in the newspaper, (laughs) uh, nobody knew who you were. In fact, Keith, real quickly, one of my biggest fears in life, been here 52 years, and the day I die... When my obituary is put out there, will anybody really come to my funeral? <laughs> well, we'll have to use your air name. That's what's going to have to happen. That's great. Well, I was just thinking James Bond right there. Yep. Right there yep. is is a, a persona. Well, you know, unfortunately, yeah. uh, Jim James has been gone now about uh, 25, yeah. uh, no, 30, 30 years now. Wow. And uh, he was the program director at KTRN, and he'd worked uh, in and out of radio and worked some other stations in the town, but his real name was Jim Sharp. And uh, like I say, he's the man that hired me. I had much respect for him. He hired a lot of DJs. I'll run down some of the names that were back then that I know people will remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, Local boy, old high, old high, John Fulton. Uh, was Ron Solo at KTRN. Later right. went up. Boy, this 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 name is going to be familiar to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. John, uh, Ron Solo, left KTRN and went up to Amarillo. He became Shotgun Kelly in Amarillo, known by many people. Yeah. Many, many people. Stayed in the business for decades and uh, unfortunately passed away about two years ago uh, next week. But uh, we had Lance Bailey. Uh, that was there. We had uh, Johnny, Johnny Solo. And that's a case of uh, Johnny left and they brought in Ron, Ronnie Solo. Wow, that's great. <laughs> uh, we had uh, John Steele in the morning, of course. Bobby Blue did middays. Uh, Phil Knight did some midday work. Uh, he had worked up at KOMA, I believe. And 
a whole bunch of other names that over the years people can sit there and say uh, they remember someone that maybe I've forgotten. But uh, uh, some of those music surveys are still floating around from back then, 50 years ago, and you'll see all the pictures, all the names, and the, the hit songs back uh, from 50 years ago. Now, you mentioned uh, John Steele mornings. Yeah. Um, in those days, morning drive wasn't looked upon as the prime show as it is in later years. Um, it was still a big deal to be in the morning drive. Oh, yeah. But uh, it wasn't the you know the prime spot that it turns out to be later. Um, whatever happened to old John Steele? I remember listening oh, to him. I wish I knew. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, sought out people nationwide on uh, now that we have Facebook in some of the radio groups, and I have actually run on to people that did work with John out in Portland, Oregon. Uh, John had worked up in Kansas City at the Big Top 40. Of course, he'd been mornings at uh, Kelly up in Tulsa. Uh, John came to Wichita Falls. Uh, when you start out in radio, a lot of times you start out at the bottom, you work your way up to the top, and then as you mature, sometimes you kind of come come mm-hmm. down that ladder a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the way it, it, it worked out for John and had – tremendous respect for john i only wish i could have kept up with him mm-hmm. if he were alive today john would have to be in his early 90s yeah, if bet. he was alive yeah. today wow i remember his photo on the surveys right he looked seasoned he looked like he'd, he'd he, he was lots of radio he was and of course like i say he had worked the major markets up in kansas city yeah. i believe he may have actually brought the beatles on stage wow uh, up in that area which was not uncommon for djs yeah. to do i've done that myself and uh you know i'm sure yeah. you have all the radio mm-hmm. people yeah mc concerts oh yeah that's a way to pick up a little extra money on the side <laughs> or a free t-shirt oh yeah <laughs> or you get uh mc the concert and get the free t-shirt you bet man well at ktr in those those days you guys were downtown in the Hamilton. No, no, no. That was K and I. Oh, that's right. You were on the. Uh, we were on the north side, yeah. out off Keel Road on Keel Telephone Road. Drive. Now, uh, if yes, I remember the building. Um, going to work out there, just the physical job of going to work at that building was kind of a job in its own. Uh, I remember going out there at night. You have to fight mosquitoes and moths to get past the lights in the the front of the building. Um, what uh, you worked out there in the evenings and at night? Um, kind of creepy out there alone. Well, at, at night. that time, Wichita Falls uh, city yeah. limits ended way before yeah. you got out there. Now, of course, uh, uh, that that building, which is no longer a, a radio station, it's a residence for someone now, but uh, it is in the city limits. But that back then, if we had a problem, we had to call the sheriff. And back in those days, fifty years ago, they didn't quite move as fast as they move now. <laughs> I remember that building. I, I my first radio experience was in that very <laughs> building way way back. Now w- when you got on the air at KTRN and you got into Wichita Falls, uh you made a quite a name for yourself early on, but it not only in radio, but you were doing mobile DJ work too. Well, before that, yeah. let me toss out some names that I know some of the older more mature listeners will remember. <laughs> uh as a result of the low Pay and radio. I was pulling down. You know, sometimes people like to hear stuff like this. I was pulling down 120, 125 a week at Man. KTRN, and that was 48 hours of work. It wasn't 40 hours. It was 48. Yeah. And so it didn't take long to figure out uh, I needed to supplement my income. Well, long about 1973, a new club came to town like no other club before, and it was called the Seymour Highway Electric Company. Oh yeah lighted dance floor this we were doing the disco with a lighted dance floor six years before john travolta ever heard about it any rate i got to call to uh see if i would be interested to be the disc jockey the first disc jockey at seymour highway electric company i said absolutely i want to see my audience in radio of course you know you don't see the audience but when you're working the club standing up in the box and you're spinning the music Looking out on that lighted dance floor and you see 200 people having the time of their life and you're controlling their emotions. It was the hottest club in town. People were spending money hand over fist. People lined up through the Fremar Valley out to Seymour Highway to get in that frickin' front door and they paid <laughs> Joe Martin $3 an hour. Man. It would, yeah. <laughs> yeah After that came the Mad Hatter, then the Dance Factory, and then Old Joe hit the big time. 
Well, I remember. I'm going to, you know, I know a lot of uh, radio guys hate it when this happens. I hate it when it happens to me. But when I was a kid, I used to listen. Yeah. When I was in junior high school, um, I went over to MSU to the band camp dance. Oh, well, they, are you going to tell me you were there and I was playing the Oh, the oh yeah, you were the DJ. <laughs> you had your setup, man. It was you had the uh, the, the the police light, yeah. the uh, the strobe light, the tambourine and the big cowboy hat. And at that time I would have been about 35, wouldn't I? Mid 80s? Uh, yeah. Mid-80s. No, it was earlier. This would have been like 77, 78. Okay. I was about yeah. 27 years old. Yeah. And I'll never forget, I do have one memory of your band camp. Really? A young lady comes up to me, looks at me, looks me up one side, down the other, and says, what time does the disc jockey get here? Oh, <laughs> hey. Yeah, that's got to hurt. <laughs> well, it was a Man. little bit of a sting. Yeah, but a I little can, bit. I can tell the story now Man. 50 years later. That's great. Well, what I remember, Joe, was uh, one of the songs is pumping out, and, and you get that tambourine, and you got that cowboy hat on. You come out on the – you're dancing with everybody. You're going around the dance floor. <laughs> it's you're, – you're a walking party. I mean, it was amazing, and – uh, from you know years after that, I, w- I would see your van going around town, uh-huh. and I'm thinking there is a rolling party right there, man. That's <laughs> disco on the go. Disco on the uh, go. And I think on uh, that '74 Dodge van I had, I think I had on the back. You're following the madman. Yes, yes, <laughs> I re- yes, you did. Awesome. Now, KTRN, how many years uh, did you spend actually on the air? Total time. Uh, total time was seven, seven and a half years, but, yeah. uh, the last three were just part time. Really? I was, yeah. yeah. Uh, when I said things got crazy along about 76, uh, that's actually when I went to part time status mm. and it didn't take long before I was making more money working the clubs. We'd gotten into mobile DJ work. Right. That's yeah. where the money came. Although the first few years were pretty lean, uh, back then we didn't know what to charge. First mobile DJ job I did was at Hershey High School, wow. about 1975, 74, mm-hmm. and I got paid $12 an hour for a three-hour dance. I Man. considered myself wealthy when I compared it to radio pay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would that would that would be a step up. But yeah, it definitely was a step up. But in light of the way those rates would turn out that was oh it, it, yeah. it got uh, if you've ever if you're a, an adult now and you've ever planned a wedding hired a wedding dj for your daughter or son's wedding uh you know that mobile djs get paid a whole hell of a lot more than 36 dollars now yeah a lot a lot more but where things really changed for me though keith that uh, a lot of people just don't have any knowledge of was shepherd mm. air force base oh yeah when i went to shepherd I, yeah. I had last gig i did club wise was dance factory long in the mid 70s and then uh a little after that i got the call to come out to shepherd air base and uh i became instrumental as the uh main dj probably i i would have to i was working the most nights at the airman's club mm-hmm. also worked at the officers club and the nco club as well as the youth center back in those days and to be honest with you uh it's hard for the local sector to compete money wise with government money right they were taking care of old joe oh yeah yeah i've heard from rock bands that, uh-huh. that would play out there well, they and, love and, going out there and that was another one of the perks i got to bring on several numerous rock bands yeah. we could tell my rem story i know you probably oh, we're heard. Gonna, yeah we'll have to uh, you know that may be in part three or four but we'll I'll tell the REM story. I worked with uh, uh, Head East. Never been any reason. Head yeah. East out of St. Louis. Uh, uh, Dr. Demento and oh, uh, Weird yeah. Al Yankovic. Yeah. Got to bring them on. Great guys. And uh, Joan Jett. She had the number one song in the country back, what, 82? She 82. had played Six Flags on a Saturday night on her way to Denver, for Monday night, she stops in at the Airman's Club at Shepherd Air Base and does a concert to a place that was packed people on people. Man. Concert was excellent, and the people of Wichita Falls had no idea. No Joan idea. Jett was playing out there six miles from downtown. That is that is that's crazy and amazing, too. Yeah, Shepherd Air Force Base, they they 
they took care of their airmen. I think they still do, but well, in, those, in those days, it was a big, a, a bigger game. You yeah. know, keep in mind, back in those days, the drinking age was 18. Oh, yeah. And yeah. let me tell you, yeah. those airmen were putting away the beer. <laughs> That's where I became. Uh, I got to back in those yeah. days uh, from Midwestern. And Shepard got to become friends with Reno Gustafson, who, oh, as yeah. many, many people will know, Reno was associated with Falls Distributing and Budweiser. And yes. They did promotions. Uh, all the beer companies did promotions out there. I'll never forget Five Cent Long Neck Night at Shepard Air Force Base Airman's Club, and they were selling more beer than the Astrodome. <laughs> when, you were, uh, w- when your time at KTRN, uh, came to an end. What was the next move that you that you made in radio? Take a rest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will tell you. Uh, it basically. Let's go back to 1979, April 10. Oh yes. Uh, let's do that. Uh, well, yeah. the, the tornado came, and I actually had left radio around January 30th, just a few months before. Mm-hmm. Uh, January 30th of 79, tornado comes. But I had left radio uh, on not, not so good terms with the owner of the radio station. Yeah. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Sure. Uh, it was time to take a rest, uh, of which I did. And then about a year later, the, uh, the Urban Cowboy comes along. And uh, <laughs> oh, it did. This tie, it yeah, did. this ties in actually with Cumulus and Big Jim Russell. Oh my gosh! Big Jim contacted me and said, uh, "Joe, would you consider coming over to KLUR and doing Sunday afternoons playing country, Urban Cowboys Hot? I've got my mobile entertainment business going. Right. I'm kind of switching that over to the Urban Cowboy sound. Sure, sure. And I said, let me get some of that free KLUR promotion." Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I came over and worked over here and uh, uh, at KLUR and with Jim, and I love to tell this story that I lasted a whole six days at KLUR, <laughs> but in essence, it was six Sundays. Yeah. Well, like uh, I, 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 my mind is moving right now. <laughs> I can only imagine what it would be that would keep you only doing six shows. I, I worked at KLUR uh, in my early days too, and. It was a culture shock when I when I showed up there. It was, yeah. uh, and, and I was, you know, I was a top forty guy, but I was yeah. kind of running a top forty country show mm-hmm. to a degree with the delivery. But uh, let me tell you, I I matured a lot in radio well after that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, those were still the early days for yeah. me. I had been part time radio for so many years that I didn't cultivate some of the things that I. I learned later in life in in the business, uh, but then after KLUR came a four four year layoff, where I devoted that time to my uh, business. Right. Um, I'll back up a little bit here. You mentioned you know uh, part time and in, in working at KTR and then over at KLUR and then of course later at other stations. But Joe, uh, when you Talk about Wichita Falls radio, and you say to somebody, you know, uh, name me some air talent from Wichita Falls. Your name pops up right away, you know. <laughs> so for somebody who was just part time, it was had a number of years off in between stations. You made a you made a pretty big impact for yourself, and you did it without an advertising agency. Behind well, you. that's true, <laughs> and oh, we could tell so many stories about how I uh, promoted. Yeah, uh, you know. I, I like to think that I was more of a promoter at that point than an enter- entertainer mm-hmm. because I was uh, I was the king of promotions uh, when it came to uh, being a mobile DJ and so forth. I'll never forget, I had been out of radio uh, a couple of years, uh, two or three, and, and I think out at Ryder, I think in the annual, they had uh, a poll of the students at Ryder and they wanted to know who is your favorite DJ. And Jim Russell came in, number one. Mm-hmm. And I came in number two, and I had been out of radio for three years. <laughs> <laughs> Just what I was saying. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I I, I, rem- I think I know that annual. I think I, 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 I it that may have been may one have, of my years. I think it yeah. would be. I think yeah. it would be. Um, the, yeah, the, the, uh, you, 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 you bring up Wichita Falls Radio, and there's a number of names 
Russell, Joe Tom White, you know, come up. And then, of course, Snuff Garrett's name always is brought up. But your name pops up. I mean, it, it's mentioned all the time. And Well, don't sell yourself uh, self short, Keith. Well, I, I appreciate <laughs> that. The, the other thing about you, Joe, was you mentioned the promotional aspect. I remember uh, seeing you at events and... You had your own face on your own T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, crazy. And, and there may be a few of them out there. And yeah. I still actually have a few of that specific one. They were sold, I think, the jean place out in the mall. We actually sold these. It might have been John's jeans oh, on yes. the west end of the mall. Right. But the neat thing, I promoted these shirts in high school colors. Oh, so with old high, it yeah. was a red shirt. Yeah, it was a light blue shirt out at uh, Hershey, and it was a <laughs> dark goldish yellow shirt for Ryder. Wow! And uh, of course, we didn't leave Burke out. We 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 didn't leave Holiday out. <laughs> and we would sell these shirts out at the dances. That is great. Not only the T-shirt, but uh, the "I'm Mad to Martin." bumper sticker <laughs> which was kind of iconic for a number of years well, it was. around town uh that that was all off the eddie childs thing i'm mad to eddie wasn't it yes uh, I, uh, that started in texas i'd have to even go back and do a little research but but all that came about in the mid 80s and then of course there was the mad i'm mad to ozzy for diary of a madman yes that was good uh, but we did we did the i'm mad to martin stickers and they were real popular uh, and I still probably have a few around. I, I've got one myself, and, and I can't remember who it was, but somebody, I showed it to them, and they, you could you could tell they didn't know what, what was going on. <laughs> so I had to explain Eddie Childs. Yeah. And you might do that real quick, Joe, for those who might not well, know and what I we're talking about. Didn't he own a sports team in Texas? He, I think he, he I think he made his money in oil and gas. Okay. But, but I think he was involved somewhere right. with sports. And yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he was known as uh, being a little controversial, and yeah. he certainly was very opinionated. Yeah. And so he ran with the statement, I'm too, I'm mad to Eddie. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I believe I'm correct on that. I so think that's we, right. we jumped yeah. on we jumped on the "I'm Mad to Martin" bumper sticker, and I mean, it, it was a shoe in. It was a giveaway, and uh, what's even better, I got the radio station to pay for them. <laughs> that's even better. Yeah, uh, Eddie uh, Eddie Childs uh, would buy airtime. He would just. You know, like uh, he'd buy 60 second spots all over the state, and you couldn't escape the guy. He was on the radio all the time. Right. Yeah. Eddie Childs kind of reminded me of H. Ross Perot. Kind exactly. Of. Yeah. 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 Sort Absolutely. of, kind of. Well, now, they both had money. They did. <laughs> Lots of it. He could buy all that at radio airtime. The, the uh, I'm Mad 2 Martin stickers, uh, phenomenal success. Now, when you leave KTRN, you say you're, you're out for a couple years. Um, what what went on that they got you back into broadcasting? What was the the next thing that happened? Oh, Keith, for for years in the back of my mind, I had wanted to have an oldies show. Yeah, I had wanted to, uh, and and keep in mind, back in the late seventies, early eighties, there were not a whole lot of oldie top forty shows. There might have been some big band shows. Yeah. But uh, as far as 50s and 60s, there weren't too many. And so I had promoted uh, or thought about the idea of approaching one of the local radio stations around 83 to do an oldies radio show. And uh, as it would happen to be, I came back to work at KTRN, KTRN 1290, and came back to do country for three months during the book. Uh, that's the ratings book. Yeah. Well, now somebody might say, why in the world did you go back to country after you'd left KLUR after six days? Well, it was to get my foot in the door. Because in that same building as KTRN was KKQV, QV103. Yes. All right, I put my time in for three months on KTRN and played the country, and every day I would go in there and talk to management and talk to programming and say, I want to do an oldie show Sunday mornings on QV103. Sure enough, that summer, I debuted with my oldie show that I produced. Uh, there were not a whole lot around the country. There were certainly some, but this, this was something new to Wichita Falls. And we named that show Wax Tracks, W-A-X-T-R-A-X. 
three hours on Sunday morning. Uh, I would come in at 6 a.m. and go till 9. Well, the show did so well, had so many listeners that uh, when I suggested we move it to 9 to noon, they said, let's go for it, and that gave me three hours extra sleep. I was doing that actually for my benefit, but also benefit of the listeners who I knew we would have a lot more, 9 to noon. So we ran with that show seven and a half years, and it was uh, probably the happiest days for me in radio at that point. Uh, I was playing the music, and I, I programmed it. Uh, the, I worked with 10 program directors while I did Wax Tracks. That's 10 program directors in seven years. Wow. Yeah. But they let me do my thing. I believe it. I mean, we see them coming, we see them go. Or we used to all the time, You're, no <laughs> doubt. Now, you, you uh, did Wax Tracks seven years. That's yeah, yeah. Every, every Sunday morning. Seven and a half, actually. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, that's with relatively no time off. I mean, you're there every Sunday. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, I do know that uh, a couple of Sundays, maybe uh, during that length of time, I would take a Sunday off and go on vacation. Now, keep yeah. in mind, I'm working full time doing right. the dances at Shepherd Air Force Base Clubs. The mobile work. I'm traveling all over Texas uh, doing the mobile work. Uh, working on Saturday night down around Abilene to be on the radio Sunday morning in Wichita Falls. All right, I'll vouch. Uh, I'll vouch for that truth uh, because here I go. I'll tell my quick story. I was working at QV 103 weekends, overnight, doing the, the shift nobody wants. And Joe would roll in like, uh, I don't know, 4 or 5 a.m., I guess. Yeah. Uh, you'd roll in in your van to the studio uh, in the morning. You'd come in and you'd say, all right, I'm going down to the conference room and I'm going to go to sleep on the table. Yep. Uh, when it's about 10 minutes to nine, come down, wake me up. And that's what I would do. And that went on for, I don't know, a year, maybe. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. I have I have many not so fond memories of that. <laughs> but Joe, uh, you know, Another thing I was thinking about on the way over here for this interview, um, you didn't miss the show. I would go down there and say, hey, Joe, you got 10 minutes, and you, uh, sometimes you didn't move at all. But when it was time to get the mic turned up, you were there, and you were ready to go, and you weren't groggy, you weren't sleepy, you were, you were fired up and ready to do radio. Oh, and, yeah. and it's easy. You know, when you, uh, when you pop on as your first uh, song out of the shoot. Uh, Mitch Ryder, Detroit Wheels, Devil with a Blue Dress on, baby. Matt Martin's dancing behind that microphone. Yes, absolutely. And that brings me to another thing. Um, I, I was having this discussion uh, with the crew here at, at my radio station, and there's a lot of computers being used today. There's a lot of uh, use of you know uh, audio editing and digital software. It just kind of takes away the live element so much and I, I was explaining to them the other day I said I don't know if anybody is going to ever understand the absolute it's like electric energy when you walk into a radio studio that is broadcasting and it's turned over to you the guys say, all right I'm done it's yours and they walk out you look around the room you are in control. You're flying in the 747? Yes. You plug that headphone in, and the music's playing, and you've got all this... Oh, it's it's not out of line to say power, because it is kind of powerful, but it's all right there. You're the one in control of it. It's it's a unbelievably great experience, and uh, especially when it's a live thing, when you're right there, boom, in the moment, in the element, and it's going on, and... I remember in those days, Joe, you'd come in and you'd start your show and I'd be leaving to head home. I couldn't wait to get in my car and turn you on and listen on the way home. I mean, I could have stood there in the studio and watched you, but it's different in the yeah. car. It was magic. Yeah. It yeah. was magic. Um, I could sit there and watch you in the studio. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. But in the car, the added element well, of what it's really how about. many times yeah. and I, I don't know that the listeners today have heard this term but uh how many times in radio have you heard the terminology theater of the mind right yeah yeah as a kid growing up back to that i i would listen to klif and when that morning man was talking about the horse that he had in the 
uh, studio with him and you would hear the horse <laughs> make a noise in your mind you knew there was a horse in that studio yes yes i don't know how many times joe and i hope i'm not giving away too much but i don't know how many times i've gone home and my wife will say hey um someone at work told me that you said something or other and i'll go honey honey that's it's, it's bs it's all part of my show it, it, it. <laughs> Don't take it at face value. I was kind of exaggerating a bit. Well, that's kind of like going back to reform school story. (laughs) Yes. So it's the, the, yeah, the theater of the mind is amazing and it's still there, but it's. Yeah, I I think it's changed a little. It's changed a lot. And the influx of all this other media and, and, you know, the ability to uh, see and and hear things instantaneously or it takes away that, that kind of magic. Um, Joe, another thing um, I wanted to bring up was uh, the days when you got over to QV103. Uh, you only, not only did you do wax tracks, you were the midday man. Well, yeah, <laughs> I was, and I took that on. I'll never forget. That was about the time that Sun Group had come in and bought the station yeah. from the Brandon brothers who had owned it. They were out on the West Coast. And Sun Group, a big corporation, this was the early days of corporate buyouts back in those days for yes. radio. Yeah, And uh, I came, came, we had a meeting when the uh, suits came over from uh, – Sun Group, and I believe they were stationed uh, maybe maybe over in Georgia, Tennessee, somewhere over there. Right. And I'm in the uh, room with a group of all the employees, and they get to me uh, to introduce myself. And I said, my name, name is Joe Martin, and uh, if you'll check the books, uh, the ratings last book uh, for middays was a two. And I guarantee you, gentlemen, I'll have you a ten. Wow. Things went silent. <laughs> wow. Uh, Man. My goal in life and uh, <laughs> was to uh, to do a midday show. And, and this was not playing oldies. This was playing the, uh, the top 40 mm-hmm. CHR hit music. Uh, I wanted to beat K&I in midday. And I'll say yeah. who it was. Uh, she may listen. She may not. Brenda Kay was the midday girl. Yes. Brenda Kay was Brenda the midday girl. Midday yes. girl at KNIN, and I said, uh, I want to beat Brenda. That's my goal. And when the ratings came in after that three month, four month period, Brenda ended up beating me by a half a point. Oh. But I gave Sun Group a 10 share. There you go. Now, let me, I don't want to get into any territory I shouldn't be in. Now, when you say you wanted to, to, compete and beat brenda k was it competitive or just some personal there no nothing personal yeah nothing because brenda was always very well, nice absolutely yeah and she was a young girl at that time here i am the old dog yeah uh, now granted i was only 37 uh at the time is that right yeah yeah about 37 Roughly, yeah yeah uh brenda was probably 20 21 right yeah. uh <laughs> and and i i never even told this story to brenda but i certainly told it to others and there at uh, QV103, after we got the ratings in that day, I turned in my notice that I would no longer be doing middays. Wow. I did not I, I didn't that. take it personal. Yeah. But I did stay on and continue to do the, uh, the oldie show, Wax Tracks, for another four years. Yeah. I Up until that. about 91. Right. Yeah. And I was the last and only live disc jockey on QV103. Everything else was satellite and syndicated. Yeah, I remember those days. I remember when that all went down. Well, and a yeah. lot of those QV guys uh, went over to KNIN at that point. They shifted directions and went into KNIN. And then later, I went over and joined them uh, to go back to part-time work on Sundays uh, no, no oldies anymore. I had ridden that pony for seven years. Uh, but so many of these years, and we didn't even mention this, Keith, mm-hmm. I was not even taking a paycheck when I worked for QV 103. Yeah, the, I remember the rumor was you you got paid in promotion. 
Well, yeah. I got paid in advertising, yeah, and yeah, advertising yeah. was a whole lot more valuable to me right. than four dollars an hour. Yeah. And when I went to K and A and stayed there seven years, I there were fifteen years in radio that I never saw a radio station paycheck. Wow. Couldn't tell you what colors they look like. <laughs> that is amazing. And then, of course, we go into the uh, up into the nineties further, and you you wind up on one zero four seven the bear. And I think we'll. We'll, we'll put that into the chapter two of okay. our talk. Okay. But I want to roll back and, and discuss some, some of the uh, uh, stuff with these other radio stations. Um, when people talk about, you know, the, those days of radio in the 70s and 80s here in Wichita Falls, the competition was, was pretty unbelievably hostile. There was a lot of competition. Oh, there really was. Now, I, I, let's go all the way back to the 70s, though. Yeah. KTRN and KNI, and I was friends with those guys. Yeah. Uh, you had Bob uh, Bob Walker over there. Lynn Marshall, local guy. Yeah, Lynn, Lynn Bellows, old high. Uh, gone way too early. Yeah. Uh, been gone now maybe five, six, seven years, but – uh, we were friends, and we would hang out. We would hang out with each other. But I got to tell you, the QVK and I in battle, it was brutal. It, it was, was ugly. It yeah. was nasty. It was. And I was just getting into the business in those days, so I wasn't really privy to what was you know, going on. But I look back now, and yeah, I see it. And it management down, it was bad. Yeah, it was tough. Well, and yeah. I think it all boiled down to pride. Yeah, I think it boiled down to the uh, with the management and sales staffs to who could sell the most. Yeah, I think some of the animosity probably occurred over uh, accounts out there with uh, businesses. Uh, maybe one station getting more of a buy than the other station, and then it played into the hands of the DJs uh, watching those rating books uh, like I was watching them. Uh, but I reiterate again, uh, there was no animosity whatsoever towards Brenda at that point, uh, mm-hmm. or ever, for that yeah. matter. And I believe, what is ironic, if I'm not mistaken, Brenda Kay and her husband, who was a sportsman at Channel 6, yeah. they live in Denton, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think that's and right. And they may be yeah. involved in education down there. Wow. That's yeah, phenomenal. I'm bouncing all over the place. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's what happens when we get together. Another thing about those days, um, the technology was so different, <laughs> so, so different. And I was telling somebody the other day about the uh, the surveys that, that I think it was KTRN would do. And I guess the best way to describe it was parking lot surveys. Oh, Ex- my word. Explain that to, oh, to us. This goes back to the 70s, back uh, in the days when uh, most automobiles only had an AM radio. Yeah. And uh, KTRN was notorious. I said I'd worked 48 hours a week. Part of that time was to go out and wander around the streets of Wichita Falls, going to Parker Center, uh, Parker Square and downtown and the high school's old high and rider, we had to do this once a week where we would walk up to a car in a parking lot and stick our head up to the window to see if we could see what radio station the owner of the car was listening to. (laughs) We would tally this up and turn it in every Friday afternoon at the radio station so management could see who the kids were listening to and then who the working downtown people were and the Parker Square people. I could not count the number of times that I got confronted <laughs> looking in here, hair down to my shoulder, Keith. Oh, my God. Weighed 130 pounds. Wow. And I'm up craning my neck looking in their car window. I had Prince, I'll never forget the time I had uh, Old High Principal comes running out. And he thinks I'm trying to break into automobiles oh my God. because they had seen me out the second story windows. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story, folks. Oh, man. And it was disgusting that we had to go out there and do that once a week. And would we fudge a little? That happened. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking in my head, you know, the 990 is down at this end. 1290. Yeah. It's obvious which one. It, and 620 yeah. back in those days. Oh, yeah. Days. 620. Yeah. KWFT. Yeah. It, it was easy. And uh, thank goodness FM came along in those cars because oh, then you couldn't tell what man. someone was listening to. Amazing. But I got to tell you, back in those days, KTRN was the uh, number one station. Uh, we were definitely 
beating out KNIN, and I'll go on record today and say this. I have said this to some people in this mm-hmm. town. KNIN Radio AM sounded a hell of a lot better than KTRN Radio. It had that big city sound because they were using that reverb behind the DJs. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the music they played was better. Their jingles were better. But for some reason, KTRN usually pulled out the number one ratings. Well, that is a phenomenon that you can apply to a couple of stations in this market at various times. And I've always said, uh, I'll go on record too, Joe, KLUR in in its uh, heyday in the 70s. They broke every rule of the way you do quality radio. Uh, It was unbelievable. When I went over to KLUR for my first show, I I actually thought I'd just step back in the radio stone age. I Uh mean, because I came from a a brand new studio where we had car tapes and, uh, you know, everything was uh, programmed out very tightly and... Mm -hmm. Uh, I got to KLUR and there's a clock and a wall full of records and you just pick and play and I'm I, I was confused I didn't I was very uh, what is going on here so I I, I identify mm-hmm. with with, uh, with that whole thing let me throw something in real quick and yeah. I've had discussions with people uh, concerning this had the urban cowboy mm. not come along in 1980 and had Wichita Falls not been late to the party with FM radio stations because in the major markets, the moves had been going on in the mid seventies from AM to FM. Right. That didn't happen in Wichita Falls. It didn't happen until later, late seventies. Now urban cowboy comes along summer of 1980. Yeah. And KLUR got that rocket shot and went to the moon and beyond. Yeah, you're right. Had that movie not come out, not to take anything away from KLUR, right. but that that shot to the moon might not have happened yep. as early as it did. Yeah, that, and I also think that there was a couple of times where country music uh, was, it kind of had a, uh, a renaissance. You had that, that uh, the outlaw Willie Whalen stuff in the you 70s. You did, and that occurred in the mid-70s, yeah, and there yeah. was even a station down in Dallas that that was their, what they played, outlaw country. There you go. And then, of course, Urban Cowboy. That was the next one. You know, yeah. I've, I've talked with people before that had the urban cowboy not come along when it did, mm-hmm. George Strait, who put music out shortly after the urban cowboy, yeah, George Strait might not be where he is today had it not been for the urban cowboy. Now, I, I suppose I we could have that. long discussions on that. I can see where that theory would, would, be, would be valid. I can see that. And then there was the next... Uh, Little Country Jolt, which was what I call the Hat Axe, which was that late 80s, early 90s, Garth Brooks, Clint Black, that whole right. resurgence, I guess you'd right. say. But yeah, Urban Cowboy was crazy. I remember as a kid going to the movies at Sykes Mall with two of my buddies. We watched Urban Cowboy. When that movie was over, it was like we had just drank 20 pots of coffee. I mean, we walked out of there on fire. Yeah. It, it you were just, ready to go get a, into a pickup truck and yeah. do a little driving around. Oh, it was. It, I, it, it never, changed everything. I'll never forget yeah. talking to some of my friends that were up in the Northeast, and they said, Joe, these people up here are buying boots for the first time. Hats. <laughs> Walking down Main Street in New York City with a boots yeah. and hat. Amazing. Yeah, it was it was a magic magic time for country music. Yeah. Well, no, I don't honestly. think there's going to ever be another one. Well, like no, that. and you know, even before that, uh, ironic John Travolta in the moving uh, Saturday oh, Night yeah. Fever. Yeah. Uh, that that disco had been going a number of years before that, but that uh, that really fired it up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me jump back on something else, Joe. I, I made a mental note. I was going to bring this up, and a lot of people probably will go. You know what? That's right. You don't hear Joe Martin on commercials <laughs> ever, ever. I've never heard Joe voice a commercial. I, I, slim and none. Yeah. Uh, there, there have been a few. 
I didn't even do my own commercials. That's right. I didn't yeah. even do my voice on my outgoing uh, telephone answering machine. <laughs> I paid Kyle Bush down in Dallas to sound big time. Why, why did you have someone else do your voices on your answering machine? Well, it makes the company sound bigger. Exactly. It does. And But back to yeah. what you're asking, Keith, I never felt confident in my ability to do a quality commercial. Mm. I can sit here and ad lib all day long, but when you put that copy in front of me that I have to read, mm. I freeze up. I haven't told that to too many people. Mm. Then couple that with the fact that I excelled in the mobile club DJ private party type work. Mm. That made it where I had enough on my plate that I didn't need to go after uh, the right. voiceover work. Yeah, and um, also it keeps you neutral when it comes to business. So you're not doing a spot for you know a competitor that might want to hire you to do a mobile job, for right, instance. Right, right. I've you, that kind of weird stuff does come but, up. Occasionally. But I would actually yeah. take jobs uh, in the later days. Mm -hmm. I would take jobs, and that was part of my deal with management. I will work on your radio station, but do not have your salespeople ask me to cut a commercial. What I needed back in those 70s was uh, to work with people that could show me. Yeah. Show me the tricks. Show right. me the ins. Show me the outs. And then maybe I would have uh, felt confident, had mm -hmm. that confidence, to be able to produce and voice the uh, radio commercials. But as I alluded earlier, I, I excelled in that mobile DJ work and uh, the club work that gave me that extra boost of being in that driver's seat that you talked about. When you can look out there and see, yeah, uh, at, like at the Airman's Club, hundreds of people that I motivated. When you're standing behind the microphone in the radio station, you hope that people are listening, but yeah. you don't necessarily know that they're out there beating on that steering wheel right. to uh, Doobie Brothers rocking down the highway. Yeah. I got to see it firsthand. You don't get any immediate feet, any immediate feet. You know, you get the phone yeah. calls, the people that call in, right. give you the pats on the back, and, and that's wonderful, and it's, it's needed. Uh, Any time that you can give confidence to other people, I... I uh, Patrick Fortner, uh, Linda, Linda uh, here in town. Uh, oh, Bates. Uh, Bates. Linda Bates, yes. And she often goes on the internet and talks about how Joe Martin gave her some confidence. Wow. How I gave her advice to pursue a career in radio. Wow. Uh, she got into radio. She went up to Vernon. Uh, Patrick Fortner, uh, yeah, work, yeah. worked, uh, who now lives in the Austin area, tells the story that I motivated him to want to get into Yeah. I was there. Uh, I, I was their Jimmy rabbit from KLI. Oh, there you go. You were the next. You, yeah. That, that was my next comment. You were the, uh, you were their Jimmy rabbit. You were the, the one who inspired them. As, as you were inspired. And I wanted to pass yeah. it on to others. Right. And the same over the decades has gone into the mobile DJ business. Right. I have spoken at so many conventions from Atlantic City, New Jersey, to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, to Dallas, uh, a regular speaker for a number of years out in Las Vegas. And the last time I spoke was seven years ago, six years ago. Mm. 750 DJs setting there morning one, and wow. Joe Martin is up telling them why they do not want to work until the day they die. <laughs> Keith, we could talk an hour yeah. or two. Have you ever heard Joe Martin tell disc jockeys, you need to save for your future? I, I personally have heard you say that, Joe. Yeah. I have. I've yeah. been in the room when that went on. And I've also, uh, I hit you up a number of years ago. Uh, kind of just kind of vaguely, I said something about, hey, I, I'm thinking about playing the stock market. You got any advice? And you said, nope, don't have any. <laughs> I thought that's great because I, I know where you're going, though. I, know, I don't I know, what know why means. I didn't because if you ask me well, that uh, when we get off air here, if you ask me yeah. that here in a minute, I'm sure I could come up with some good things. I've, I learned enough from experience that I could have written books on my mistakes, <laughs> and, and I could give you yeah. plenty of tips now. But, well, I uh, think what you meant was 
Uh, no, I'm not going to because if they don't turn out, I don't want you coming back to me and well, trying to say that I, I mis- misguided you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, some of my uh, worst, uh, <laughs> some of my worst picks in my lifetime have been radio station stocks. <laughs> there, there, yeah. I wonder which ones. Oh, uh, uh, let's don't get into it. <laughs> well, I think in the future, Joe, because we're going to do a, a, a number of these. Uh, I think what we'll wind up doing is busting this down into chapters. We'll do a, a KTRN chapter. Uh, we'll do a QV103 chapter, a KNIN chapter, and then a 1047 The Bear chapter. Um, I worked with Joe at QV103, and we're going to uh, know a lot of the same people and a lot of the same names. We could probably go two hours on QV alone because those were some very fun Interesting. Uh, interesting, yes. And, unbelievable and, days. And when you work with 10 program directors uh, in seven <laughs> years, ooh, you see a whole lot of personality. Yes. You mentioned something earlier, Joe, that I wanted to bring up. You, you mentioned about uh, doing commercials, and you said you kind of regretted not maybe pursuing that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And you said something about uh, learning the ins and outs of what's going on. Something I learned early in this business was nobody wanted to give up the secrets to the new dudes. I think it was kind of a way of protecting their jobs. They didn't really want to teach you how to use that production gear. They didn't want to really make you be- The PD may have, but no one else on that staff wanted to really help you. They were about helping their own careers, but they didn't want to give you any tips, any help, nothing. I, I, that's what I ran into. I, I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. And I think that is true of any, any industry. True. When yeah. you think about it. Yeah, I would say so. If yeah. you're working uh, as a salesman in a corporation and here comes the new blood, yeah. how many of your secrets do you really want to tell? Right. Exactly. Uh, when I was in uh, a bigger, a much bigger market in Dallas, uh, I remember going in one night to go on the air and the girl on before me were small talking as she's wrapping up to leave. And there's a big glass window there in the studio and someone walks by. Someone we've never seen before. <laughs> and we both freaked the hell out. Who is that? What are they doing here? Are they the next employee? Or yes. It was, it was uh, almost 10 o'clock at night. What are they doing here? Who could it be? And she says, I'm going to go out there and find out. You know, if, if that happened uh, at, at the bear, for instance, we'd like, I wonder who they're, you know, who, could, who, who are they here to see? What, nobody would feel threatened, but it, at KCPS in 1995, a strange person in the building freaked <laughs> everybody out. But yeah, I, I would run into that. Nobody kind of wanted to share trade secrets in those days. Yeah, well, and, and you have to ask yourself, do they really, how much do they want to share now? Yeah, yeah well, true, true. You know, I think that it goes, yeah. Well, and also, there is a lot to be said about learning it on your own. Yes. Through trial error you gain your experience whereas a lot of people nowadays it seems like they want to be shown right everything and maybe don't want to work as hard as we used to have to true and you just kind of nailed it right there uh all of my knowledge that i have from any kind of mixing or production stuff i i just learned it on my own with Mm -hmm. trial and error and I always tell the story. I remember my first digital audio system in my board, and I had done some uh, dry voiceover reads and sent them off to clients, and I was feeling pretty good. And then one day I realized that everything I was doing was in mono and had been for months. Yeah. I had no idea. I was like, whoa, no. And then you flipped the switch and uh, things it, sounded it, 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 Yes. The, I see the light. <laughs> yeah, things, yeah, things did change. Let me ask you another question, Joe, off on another side of the whole radio <laughs> business here. Dallas Cowboys football. Okay. The Cowboys came to Wichita Falls for training camp. Yeah. Many may remember, many may not even know. But they trained here what? Uh, 98 was the first I year. think, yeah, 98. Yeah. And um, uh, the media in Wichita Falls was all over that event those those years. And you were with the Bear, I think. It, Indeed, I was. Time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I had come on in uh, December of 97. 
Did you get to go to the camp and interact? And, and I out? did, but yeah. if we go back, if you are old enough to remember when the Cowboys did come to town for that first year, you will remember how hot oh, and yeah. humid it was during that time period. I think that year we may have even seen our first 100-degree day as early as April. Yeah. It was massively hot. Yeah. And uh, I did go out there. I did not spend as much time as the station probably wanted me to, <laughs> but I did. Uh, I entered, I acted with some people, and I did some call-in reports from out there yeah. at training camp there at the uh, Midwestern practice field, yeah. I guess, is where Yeah, it was. Midwestern State University yeah. here in the falls. It was fun for me because I, I got a kick out of the Wichita Falls media mingling with the national media. Right. And I'll say it, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. They were, a lot of them, were just absolutely horrible to Wichita Falls Media. Yeah. Looked down on us. Just, I mean, it was hilarious. I actually stood behind two guys from the ticket in Dallas. Yeah. Ripping on my morning show <laughs> while I'm standing behind them. They don't know me because they've never yeah. seen me, but yeah. I'm standing there going, Looking around, and McMillan's with me, and he's shaking his head too. And I'm just, oh my gosh! And of course, they there's more to it than that. Yeah, but but yeah, it, it was a fun time. Well, you boil it down, you know they they had gone to areas like uh, the West Coast, yes, for yeah. training camp, and yeah. and Austin, Texas, and. They come to Wichita Falls, and they're in culture shock. Yeah, yeah. And I do recall you bringing this up now. Yeah, uh, yeah some of them were, were not real favorable on our yeah. fair city. I remember hearing one of them say <laughs> uh, that afternoon, he says, hey, when we get done here, I'll go clean up and we'll get a steak. And the other guy says, well, you better hurry because everything closes at 8. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 1972, it probably did. <laughs> so that was the that was the attitude. That yeah. was that was yeah, great stuff. Well, Joe, when you uh, when you look back on those days, uh, we'll, we'll we'll say uh, your K and I and your KTRN, the AM years, okay. I guess you might say. Um, what, what what is something from those times that you know one of the the real standout, really good feel good good memory moments that come back to you there's got to be a bunch uh, well there yeah. are we're going back into the 70s now and i think of course the interaction with some of the younger listeners uh i i was barely over teenage age myself and I'll never forget we were talking about Linda Bates mm -hmm. earlier. Linda and one of her girlfriends would call me up every, you know, most every night, and we would chat for a few moments. Mm -hmm. And that's where her love for radio came. And that that was her moment, just like my moment as an eight-year-old seeing that disc jockey in the control room. There you go. So yeah. it was the interaction with the listeners. Uh, and, and back in those days, of course, being a late-night person, it dealt a lot with the teenagers, and I would listen to some of their problems. Sometimes, uh, you know, I probably didn't give great advice. Other times I might have been hurried and couldn't spend the time that I should have. Mm. There were a couple of moments now that I look back on uh, at KTRN and have regrets uh, of maybe some interaction. Uh, we, if you want to save this story for another time, it was th it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of sad. At 3 o'clock in the morning, there were four teenagers that got into the radio station to come see Mad Martin, the disc jockey. Wow. I did not know they were standing behind me at 3 a.m. Wow. There was a gun sitting next to me. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'll Yikes. leave it there, and we'll, we'll get into yeah. this story another time. Wow. That is, yeah. Yeah, that's one for, yeah, one for the ages, I can tell already. I... Uh, and I'll even throw this in to, as a teaser. Yeah. These teenagers were from Burt Burnett. Hmm. All right. Okay. That make, got, makes me wonder. Uh, well, you know, yeah. I mean, as we sit here and chat today, yeah. so many things come back. We were talking real quick. Yeah. Talking about Ron Solo, mm -hmm. uh, who later became, uh, it was John Fulton at uh, Old High, later became Shotgun Kelly up in Amarillo. But being an old high 
graduate, John, uh, Old High Rider Weekend, Mm -hmm. and the football rivalry. Oh, yeah. Uh, John got on the air pumping up the coyotes and demeaning (laughs) the Raiders. Yeah. John came out at the end of his shift at midnight, and he had four flat tires and broken mirror. (laughs) That was a valuable lesson that John, do not bring up high school football and show favoritism. That yeah yeah especially in North <laughs> Texas you don't do it and, and preface it by saying man as an old high graduate <laughs> man well there's yeah moments like that no doubt hey Joe when you, when you you mentioned working uh, the nights uh, the, that in itself adds another element to the magic of of radio uh, most people probably would not understand how nighttime radio is so different from what you do during the day yeah. um if you were going to explain to a listener why radio at night is so different what would you tell them i can sum it up when i worked ktrn uh, most well let's say one out of five calls uh, that came into the studios were from someone that was a little intoxicated oh yeah, yeah. that usually doesn't happen at seven in the morning <laughs> uh it was a bad week if i didn't receive one death threat mm. uh it was a bad month if i didn't give a, get a phone call from someone that was going to blow up the radio station <laughs> and of course you never ever ever talk about that on the air no no. You don't come on and say, I just got a guy a phone call from a guy that's coming out here to blow my brains out. Right. You don't know. No, because you do that, and now you have stirred up every looney tune in town. Yes. Yeah. And people will try to come to defend you and just make matters worse. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the, the nighttime is different in so many ways. And I used to always think to myself, uh, uh, you got people who are working tough jobs at night, you yeah. know, a lot of them. And uh, those are lonely jobs in the middle of the night. Then you got people who are just, let's be honest, they're just strange nocturnal beings who are just spending their lives up in the evenings. And those would make for some crazy conversations. Well, indeed they did. And, of course, back in the old days, that's what I call it 50 years ago, we yeah. monitored the police radios, the sheriff radios, oh, yeah. which yeah. you don't see the DJs having to do that anymore. But no. every uh, call that the dispatcher put out, we would get to hear what was going on. We would hear about the wrecks. We would hear about the shootings, the robberies. Remember the old Chiffy food stores? Uh, yeah. There one summer, there was a string of robberies at those things that would go yeah. down. And our responsibility was to call the newsman and say, get out there to the Jiffy on uh, Jacksboro Highway. There's been a shooting out there. Wow. Uh, or there's been a wreck on 369. Uh, you, you don't normally hear. Of course, most radio stations now in markets like this don't have newsmen because no. news is not that important as it was yeah. years ago, because years ago there were not as many outlets for right. news. Yeah, yeah, that's it's similar when it comes to uh, anything. When it comes to news, weather, sports, all that stuff is it's yeah. You can get that information instantaneously right anywhere. off the internet. Yeah, right off the old internet, no doubt. Another thing you mentioned: chiffy food stores and the string of robberies. Um, I remember in the seventies. That whole incident, that string of incidents, created a little urban uh, phrase around Wichita Falls. If you wound up with a little, little extra money in your pocket for some reason, let's say you were going to the movies, and, hey, I'll, I'll buy the movies. Oh, what happened? Did you go rob a jiffy? Yeah. <laughs> that was the phrase. There was one on every street corner. And, of course, yeah. you've got to be an older Wichita to even know what the hell we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. I've seen photos of the Early, early Jiffy stores where they're open. They're, the front end is just a bit like a garage Roll up door. Garage. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And they're selling fruits and vegetables. Think out of the front. flies oh, and the mosquitoes man. and the animals getting in. There. Yeah, it was a yeah different time. If anybody uh, wants to see an original Jiffy food store, there's uh, one building on Norman Street in Wichita Falls. Know exactly where yeah, you're talking. It's about. just right down from Kerry's Corner, and you'll see it because it's got that strange colonial little spiral mm-hmm. thing in the. And on the roof. Good days. Joe, did you uh, have to do a lot of remote broadcasting? That kind of came under the same heading as uh, 
uh, commercial yeah 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 <laughs> but although i did mm-hmm. uh later in life i kind of said let's let's don't do it and mm. i might take them on uh my choice basis right uh if it was one that i wanted to do but back then uh, typically those remote broadcasts would be on a saturday and that would somewhat interfere with my ability right. to go out and do that uh, yeah. that teenage party now when i mentioned earlier joe when i worked at qv 103 and you would come in on sundays for wax tracks and you were coming in from another job that night before right where were you coming from if i remember right it might have been the dallas fort worth area oh back in those days yeah. we were traveling all over west texas yeah. uh before it was all over in texas and oklahoma mm-hmm. i had worked in over 150 schools wow there i worked schools up uh in the northeast part of oklahoma that were south of uh tulsa i would get up south of amarillo i would go down towards abilene and I would work south of Fort Worth, and I could be uh, in Amarillo or close to Amarillo on a Friday and down in Burleson, Texas, on uh, the next day. And then I would be on the radio on Sunday morning. It, it was a rough schedule. It Man. was a real rough schedule. Well, you know, Joe, it just goes to show that um, your work ethic was a big part of uh that promotion you're talking about. Because if you're not on the air, you can't be on the air and you were always on the air when you were supposed to be well that's true yeah. and you know even though i took out those uh years of rest and got away from radio as we said earlier my name was still out there it yeah. was on the back of those cars uh it was on those t-shirts yeah uh it was in the promotions that i was doing when when i got into karaoke in the mid 90s oh we said we said Texas on fire yeah. with karaoke. Oh, I remember. Yeah, uh, big not, time. Not just Wichita Falls. And yeah. I worked a lot of clubs. I had, at that point, I had five employees working with me. Yeah. I, yeah, Mad Martin's all-star DJs. I yeah. remember. Yeah. I, um, t- talking about being on the air and being there and ready to go, um, it's like any job. If 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 you volunteer and you when it's time to work, you, you get on the air and you do a good job. When you said you'd, you'd pull in a 10-share and you did i mean that's that's kind of part of it you s- well that was a gutsy statement on my part and it shocked yeah. the people that i worked with <laughs> i think i got their attention at corporate yeah. though oh well and, then, and i delivered and you delivered that's that's the point yeah uh doing what you're supposed to do and delivering and coming through um joe the the, the product of radio in those days i was just thinking the the magic of the moment and the, the way it it uh was such a part of life I can remember, I was just sitting here trying to remember specific moments of listening. I can remember being a teenager uh, and being preparing to go hang out with friends and coming out of the shower and be getting ready and have the radio on in the bathroom, you know, and the songs of of that time being played. And it was setting the mood for for the night and what was going to happen. I remember riding in my sister's car, her Maverick, 73 Maverick, and (laughs) she had the one the AM radio in there. And she had the habit of singing to every song full volume. (laughs) But I remember we'd be singing along or she'd be playing the radio and singing. And the KTRN had the great feature in those days of the instant backtrack backtrack. And she would sing the dang jingle in, in, you know, it, cause we all knew it so well. It's amazing. You would bring that up because when I'm out on the street yeah, and these, these are dealing now with people in their, their sixties and their seventies and they bring up the KTR in backtrack. <laughs> that's probably the one thing about that radio station that is brought up more than any other thing. And, yeah. and all it was, we would hit that little jingle that would say KTR in backtrack. Yeah. And all the while, while that is playing, we would turn the music down, the volume down, and just pick up the tone arm and set it back as close to the front of the record as we could. Occasionally, that needle would end up on the felt, and it would be... (laughs) That was the KTRM backtrack. Uh, But then we would would try to make light of it. And say, oh, oh, the the, the record has uh, malfunctioned. We would, st- <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I believe there's a problem with the record. Let me see. <laughs> wow. Let me see. <laughs> Let me take it off the turntable. <laughs> 
<laughs> snap. <laughs> that was theater of the mind. Oh, uh, it was good stuff. I remember being at the swimming pool and a song would come on that we really liked. And I think we had the theory that if we called in and requested a backtrack, that the jocks would do it. And we would call and call, and sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. But, man, we thought we conquered the world when that actually happened. And it's yeah. probably now, in retrospect, from 50 years ago, one of the cheesiest things that was ever done on radio. <laughs> well, somebody told me years ago that it was also a time-saving tool, like if you ran out of time to cue the next record. Well, if you need to yeah. guess and if you needed to stretch. Yeah. But back in those days, we ran more commercials. If you added up all the elements that we had to do, the pet patrol, the movies that were oh, showing, yeah. the weather, yeah. on and the sports, on and on, we would have 70 minutes of material that had to be fitted into 60. Wow. Yeah. The only way we could do that was to drop about a minute out of the songs. And you talk about upsetting listeners. Oh, if yeah. it's their favorite song and you yeah. fade early, Ooh. that's where the death threats came. <laughs> Fading early. Don't want to do it. Well, Joe, the uh, other thing about those days, I remember when you were, it had to be QV um, when you were doing wax tracks early on. And it was a Sunday morning, and I called in a request. I wasn't even in the business at that time, just a listener. And I requested uh, Crosstown Traffic. Oh, Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. And it was I bet the, I played it. You did. It was the next song. Yeah. and It, it was one of my favorites. It made my week. I mean, so moments like that, I remember them. So I've always tried to, in my career, to remember those feelings yeah. and try yeah. to Relate that, and in, in, uh, I, you know, Joe, you probably had it too. You've had the casual run in with a listener, and you're in a hurry, and you're trying to get somewhere. And sure, when you leave, you're like, "Dang, I hope I didn't short short yeah, that person's yeah, uh, yeah. attention." Those are the, the yeah. regrets. Yeah, yeah, and they do come and go. They they do happen. But you mentioned earlier the the the, the positive, the really the big memories of those years. Um, what do you think the listeners remember about you, Joe? Whenever they whenever they Look back. Oh, I have to look back over the 52 years in Wichita Falls. And I'll be yeah. honest, Keith, uh, I'm, I'm probably burying my soul today more than I have in a long time. Some of the things that I did over the years uh, in public, uh, I'm not real proud of. Uh, but there's other times that I, I like to think that I was the inspiration to some. Mm -hmm. uh, as you alluded to a moment ago, it's it's tough to be nice to everybody all the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we need to remember, uh, anyone that uh, is in the public eye needs to remember that there's always eyes watching. Absolutely. We always uh, used to say that uh, always act like the mic is on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Even when it's not, and uh, but those are some of the regrets. But who the hell hasn't? If yeah. you've lived seventy three years like me, who in the heck doesn't have some regrets? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think sometimes uh, we sit and we dwell on the the things we didn't do right or did wrong or should have done and didn't do. But you, but don't give enough credit for the times that things were done right. You know. Yeah, and oftentimes yeah. I think it's human nature uh, Nature sometimes to remember mm -hmm. the bad uh, eas easier than yeah. some of the good. The bad sometimes sticks in your mind. and uh, But you can only have so many regrets. And if anyone listening, if I, if, if I ever wronged you, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, just say it that way. There I am go. truly sorry as I am uh, uh, aging and getting older and uh, getting closer to the maker. Uh, I need to be apologetic, and I am. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's where the heart should be. Let me roll into another uh, horrible segue here. Chevrolets. Okay. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, early on when I met Joe, pr uh, prior to me being in broadcasting, I was at a car show with my dad, and there was Joe Martin with a 56 yep. Chevrolet Nomad. Red and white. Yeah. It seemed so fitting back in those days that Mad Martin would have a nomad. <laughs> and that car I bought uh, down in Irving, I believe, and paid $2,500 wow. for it. Wow. About a $100,000 car now. Dang. <laughs> now, that's not the only uh, Chevy Nomad, right? No, I, yeah. I had two. Uh, 
and I've, I've had so many cars and uh, Corvettes and been in the clubs. I was one of the founders of the Texoma Classic Chevy Club back in about, well, 50 years ago. Yeah. And uh, there were a couple of us that formed that club, and we had 25, 30 strong uh, members. There were lots of 55, 6s, and 7s rolling around town. Don't see near as many now, but uh, yeah. they, they were an everyday occurrence back in those days. Yeah, they were. What is it about the – the nomad that, that drew you a low production one yeah. thing a uh, very classy car yeah uh one of the most expensive chevys you could have bought at the time uh, yeah. only corvette would have been more expensive wow uh what we're talking about is a two-door hard top station wagon and they were they were luxurious uh, in in their looks uh, Pontiac also had a version of it. I didn't like it as much, but it was called a Safari. Yeah, and uh, they made even less of those. But if you talk about the Chevy Nomad, they only only made about oh three thousand a year, I believe. Yeah. I think I'm right on that. Now, uh, you are a car enthusiast, I guess is the word. I, I hate to use the word hot rodder because that really is. Uh, I, ha- uh, I have a strong love yeah, for cars. There you go. And you've had a number over the years, and I remember the, the two Nomads, and I remember the Corvettes. But what other rides in there? That- I think one of the one of the premier cars for me is a '64 Impala, Chevy wow. Impala '64 two door yeah. hardtop. Yeah, I've owned five or six of them. The best being a uh, uh, Impala Super Sport convertible. Mm. Uh, had twenty five factory options and every rare option that you didn't e- couldn't even conceive was a factory option was on this car. I bought it up in St. Louis. I flew up there. Guy said he wanted seventy five hundred dollars for it, and this was back in the mid eighties. Yeah, seventy five hundred dollars. I said no, it's a sixty four. Let me give you sixty four hundred dollars. <laughs> he said drive it back to Texas. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, That's and when I sold it uh, two years later, I doubled my money, and it went to somewhere up in Michigan. Went wow. all the way to Michigan. Now, you years ago uh, made a confession to me. We were oh, talking boy. about cars, and you said, "Well, you know, Keith, I I did have quite a quite a fine Ford at one time." Oh, I did. Yeah, well, t- tell us that story. Out, out of the 40, 45 cars, vehicles that I've owned in my lifetime, one of the biggest regrets was getting rid of the 1969 red Ford Torino 428 Cobra Jet four-speed with Ram Air. Oh, my gosh. Bought it. I forgot it was. It was only one and a half years old when I got it for $1,000. Man. I saw one this weekend at the or two weekends ago at the Bears I forty four yeah, cruise yeah. in car show, uh, and he told me that he'd been offered a hundred thousand dollars. I, I don't doubt it. Yeah. If it was nice, if yeah. it was this one was was nice. It didn't have a lot Man. of option. No air, of course. Uh, don't even think it had power steering or brakes. But yeah. what it had was an engine, wow. uh, a nice positive track rear end, and a four speed transmission. Man. With a Hearst shifter, it had been changed out. This was a repo from the bank that my dad had worked at. Oh, and there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, we worked a little deal. There we, you we go. got it figured out. <laughs> now, this, uh, we, w- w- this will be another chapter in our continuing Mad Martin series, Cars <laughs> on Their Own. But we will touch on this towards the end of the interview today. I want to bring this up, Joe. Uh, you mentioned that when you were a kid, you immediately were into cars. Uh when you were a kid, when you when did you first notice that there was something about cars that really had your your attention? What was that first experience? I can tell you without yeah. a doubt it just like hit me in the head right yeah. now. Uh, coming out of church around 1961 or 62, mm-hmm. Methodist Church in Denton, we had a uh, bachelor that was well known. Later went on to be the mayor of Denton. Mm. But uh, he was a single man, and we came out the back door, and I saw him getting into his brand new Corvette. Wow! And I thought, man, yeah, that's living the life. <laughs> <laughs> and I got my first yeah. Corvette, uh, nineteen eighty, summer of wow. eighty. That hot summer that was one hundred and seventeen degrees, oh, and we set gosh. the all time record high in yeah. the city. But summer of eighty, I got my first Corvette. Man, now I've seen the photograph of you standing next to like a uh, mid sixty Chevelle. 
uh, with no shirt on. With no, a, with, I, actually, that's a '64 Impala. Is it really? Yeah, it is. And you're you got a racing trophy. That was the first trophy I got at Green Green Valley Raceway <laughs> Sunday. Sunday, <laughs> see Tommy Ivo. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was the first trophy about 1967. That little uh, anyone familiar with drag racing? Now it was a quarter mile track. You see a yeah. lot of eighth miles now, but quarter mile track at Green Valley. And let me tell you, Keith. Yeah. Automatic transmission, three thirty six rear end gears, two eighty three two barrel, and that. 64 did a smoke in 22 seconds. Wow, man. <laughs> and you know, honestly, we thought we were flying, didn't we? We really did. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I ran into a buddy of mine. Uh, well, I say I ran into we, we We talk over the years, but we were little hot rod street racers when we were kids. And uh, as we've gotten older, we've gotten other cars and had other experiences. But we were talking one night, and he says, you know, were we really as fast as we thought we were? <laughs> I mean, it was the early 80s, and everything was so smogged and choked down and all. Sure, sure. And I said, no, we probably weren't, but it felt like it, you know. It, it, it certainly yeah. did. When you're in the car, it uh, feels a whole lot faster than when you're sitting on the sideline. Yeah. I don't know how many times I've been in a drag race and watched a drag race and thought, Man, they are really moving slow down that track. <laughs> well, let me tell you, when you're at a drag race now and yeah. you're sitting in the stands and you look at that car and you right. say, man, that's fast. Right. Think how fast it would be if you're sitting in it. Well, I was just uh, talking uh, with my wife last night about this John Force wreck. Oh, yeah. Wreck. Yeah, yeah. Last, yeah. Last week? I think it was last yeah. week. Yeah. And I remember when Eddie Hill broke 200. And we thought that was just unbelievable. And that now they're been. doing 300 every time. Yeah. Those Unreal. were the days when the Nationals that were run, I believe, in Amarillo and Oklahoma City. Yeah. The, the Nationals, of course, back then there weren't as many uh, uh, championship races as there are now. It right. seems to be one every other weekend now. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, Eddie Hill, we get, you need to get Eddie in here. Yeah, Eddie would be a good person to yeah. talk to. Eddie's a great yeah. guy. Ursi. The, the whole yeah. the whole crew the everything. whole the whole yeah you talk about yeah a wealth of information well, and i remember yeah. the bears uh sending me down in 98 to do a remote down there at uh, eddie's place their own wow. scott yeah. and uh eddie fired up that that top fuel dragster <laughs> on scott street we're Uh-oh. talking twelve thousand horsepower oh, or fifteen man. whatever it is <laughs> i'm sure they heard it over on uh uh, 287, I'm sure. Yeah, that is great. That's good. Well, Joe, that brings me to this, man. What about uh, the connection with cars and rock and roll? And, and even country, there's a connection. Well, yeah, pickup trucks. Yeah. Uh, let's let's go motorcycles and right. rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm going to see my, my favorite band. You know who I'm going to see. Let me guess. Doobie Brothers. Going to see them yes. Wednesday night, Durant, Oklahoma. Doobies right. are going to be rocking down the highway again. Uh, they're yeah. uh, t- uh, Tom Johnston, and uh, they're bringing in Michael McDonald. He's been on that 50-year tour. The 50-year yeah. tour for the Doobies now has lasted three years. <laughs> uh, but we're going to see them. This will be seventh time for me, but seven times in 20 years. Uh, I wished I'd seen them 14 times. Yeah. They're, they, uh, they're but yeah, the tie in there, yeah, the music, the cars, the lifestyle, yeah. uh, certain bands do go. John Kay and Steppenwolf certainly went with the motorcycle crowd when you think of Born to be Wild. Yeah. Uh, the Doobies rocking down the highway, taking it to the streets. Yeah. I love to talk music. Can you tell? I love it, too. I love I love talking music with you. You know, when you mentioned the, the, the connection between uh, uh, cars and music, uh, it goes to... to the next level which is you know listening to music in your car and that's where radio comes in yeah and man i hate to hear that these young people are rolling around listening to music on a telephone yeah yeah it's crazy it's crazy i i was uh i think it was maybe a month or so ago i was watching a movie and in the movie they're, they're they're talking to each other and all of a sudden one of the person says hang on listen Hang on, it's on the radio. And they shut up and they turn the radio up and they're getting the news or whatever it was that was going on. And I'm thinking, I miss those days. I miss those days. And Well, I listened to the radio coming yeah. up here today. Uh, I'm old yeah. school. Uh, me too. <laughs> and that's the thing we get in our research, Joe, is that uh, people are still listening to radio, but 
it's in car listening. Yeah, a majority of it, in in a way. I, I think so. Yeah. I think people that listen at home might be inclined to tune into talk radio at yeah. home. Possibly. Right. Yeah. I certainly have. Yeah. Uh, all night radio, talk radio. Yeah. I have. Well, it's um, it's a strange time for media and we'll, we'll, of course we can make that another chapter we can jump into in the future <laughs> god Think, i hope i live this long <laughs> things have changed so much hey but before we wrap up today because we have uh we're, we're 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 banging on two hours here that's amazing <laughs> do you think anybody is still listening <laughs> I, I hope so man i hope so but i want to kind of tease a bit here in, in our next conversations we're going to be dropping a lot of names we'll be talking about a lot of people and some of these people are still around yeah. and i hope they don't get yeah. offended or pissed off at us because we're no, I'm, no i'm gonna let yeah. you do the pissing off not me <laughs> but i was just uh, sitting here thinking uh i want to drop some names to kind of <laughs> wet the palate you might say oh boy some people were both i think with. i know where you're going i want to bring up one guy that uh, this day i i smile when i when i think of him. would it be a qv employee it's a QV guy. <laughs> oh this guy is uh steve chambers okay steve down in the austin yeah, area steve chambers uh he was the one of my first guys i really met in radio early on good guy and i remember him uh bringing me out to the to the studio and sends me to the prod room and he says all right just go in here and play around i'm like okay i didn't know how to do anything and i didn't know how to turn anything on but he <laughs> just let me loose in there but steve chambers is one name and of course uh one of my uh, gentlemen friends and yours too eric harley absolutely man needs to be in the texas radio hall of fame yes he does he certainly does and then we go on and we we go to other people the 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 leader of our cruise ray st james i remember ray yeah sadly ray a philadelphia fella uh, yeah. passed away my gosh he's he's been gone now 18 years man died young amazing yeah man oh, that, those are the mike phillips days mike's yeah. up in the northeast oh mike ohio ohio i believe got the opportunity one time going to atlantic city to speak mm. on one of those panels that i talked about earlier I got with Ray, I got with Steve Chambers, and Mike Phillips, and the four of us had our picture taken there on the boardwalk in Atlantic wow, City. It was great. a re radio reunion. Man, a, that's a real one right there. Yeah. Man. And there was another, oh, the next PD that rolled around. <laughs> The Fox of the, that of rocks. The of the 10 PDs. Yes, the Fox that rocks. Yes. Jeff, Jeff Christensen. Yes, Jeff. Jeff went on big time. Yeah, big yeah. Time. I remember uh, when I went to work for ABC in Dallas, uh, he was down the hallway at uh, the oldies. And I believe yeah. he has uh, worked a number of years, maybe out yeah. now, but uh, he certainly lasted a number of years working major market yeah. syndicated radio. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll wrap here real quickly, Joe. But one of my great, you know, we were talking about memories in radio. I remember uh, when I would work overnights on the weekend, and Monday would come around, and that morning crew would roll into the station about four forty-five ish, and it was uh, Linda Reynolds, yes, our news girl, and Jeff Christensen, the uh, the morning, uh, the morning man, yeah, Fox, and they would come in and immediately. When Jeff walked in, his cologne would fill the room, <laughs> which was really strong. Not bad, but it was strong. And then he would go down and start making coffee. So every time he came in, you had the a mixture of this very strong, musky cologne and coffee. So anytime that, that those two odors are together it reminds me of the early mornings at qb 103 yeah. back back that, in the day that's a great story great story and linda reynolds uh who is i think she's down in east texas yes uh and working in radio she's doing some radio on a christian station yeah. down there i believe and and it's great to, to see her on facebook Fantastic. indeed and and facebook is you know facebook has some things that really aren't good about it good right. they have some bad sides yep but they certainly have a good side in allowing people to stay in touch with each other on a daily basis yeah yeah and You're there right. can be thousands of miles i'm dj buddies uh, mobile dj buddies with a uh fellow that uh formerly uh was out on the west coast and we got to know each other decades ago and he is now i believe in taiwan wow uh and we 
communicate on Facebook. When we <laughs> when we talk next time, yeah. there's several things I want you to bring up. Sure. Uh, some of some of the things that took place at KTRN, some of the good story, the wild stories. Oh yeah. And then another one is the lost tornado tape that I have been seeking for twenty years. Yeah. The lost tornado tape. We do need to concentrate on that because finding that would be unbelievable it, it would be monumental yeah. it would be yeah. historical people have uh, commented to me that they have heard that audio that you just got. just the one little clip right. that you posted that they have heard it at the museum that's in lawton i believe well and that yeah. let me tell you that yeah. originated that was sent up to minnesota you may recall that I was contacted a couple of years ago about yes. copyrights right. from yeah. a museum in Minnesota that I said, don't worry about it. I sent them a written form saying yeah. I am releasing anything to you. Probably should have checked with you first. Well, they they, they hit me up, and, okay. I, and I said, okay. well, Joe Martin is the one who recorded that. Okay. So, yeah. so I'm glad they did. But yeah. now it has come back to Texoma. <laughs> I love it. Oh, we got to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, it's good stuff. Well, it's been fantastic today. We are at the two-hour mark. Oh, we could be here. It's till, lunchtime. We could be here till tonight. So when we come back and talk next time, we'll be we'll be hitting a lot of details on uh, uh, K- uh, KTRN and into the uh, uh, rivalry between KTRN K and I N, and then into QB one hundred three, which I think is gonna it's gonna be uh, a lot of conversation, a lot of names, a lot of stories. Yeah, and I'm thinking just right now in my mind to some of the names. Uh, remember Belinda. Yes, from yeah, QV. I think she may have ended up out on the West Coast, yeah. but that's about all I know. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Great times. Well, Joe, it has been fantastic. We'll do this again very soon. Just keep coming back to the channel uh, and checking back. And, of course, hit the notification bell and all that good stuff to find out when these uh, videos go up. And we appreciate Joe Martin, Mad Joe Martin, for coming by and hanging out with us here on the Vaughn Cast. Any parting words, Joe? I want to thank you so much. It's it's been great that we have known each other uh, as long as we have. It's been great that we both stayed around town and could b- remain friends, work together, work together, and still remain friends. Absolutely, <laughs> I like how that worked out. And, and I'm I'm very honored that you thought enough of me to ask me to come up here and spend some time with you today. Well, it has been my honor, Joe, and we'll be doing more of this too, right here on the Vaughncast on Keith Vaughn's Flying Circus. And please do like, share, and subscribe.